so now uh, we're going to have a panel on bison and healthy Indian communities. A panel discussion of the health benefits of the return of bison to Indian communities. Um, we're so pleased today to have such a distinguished group of folks here to talk to us about this issue. We have um, former chairman of Standing Rock, uh, Mike Faith, uh, Dr. Mike LeBeau, who is now Vice President of Sanford Health Services Operations, and Taylor Sivertson. Sivertson? Okay. Well, which is it? Quit giggling. Did, <laughs> say what? Sivertson? I'm sorry, I should have asked you before. Uh, who is Director of Ending Hunger 2.0, Great Plains Food Bank uh, out of Fargo. And by the way, she... Was it Newtown you were at yesterday? Belcourt. She drove to Belcourt yesterday, drove back to Fargo, drove back here today, so she's been on the road a lot. <laughs> so thank you for, for coming. So what I've done is I've asked each of the panelists to think about three questions. Number one, what makes for a healthy native community? Number two, how do bison fit into that vision? And number three, what has to be done to get there? So what I've asked each one of our panelists to do is to address those three questions in about 10 or 15 minutes, and then uh, we'll have discussion amongst the three of them, and then we'll open it up to a conversation uh, with you, and we appreciate that. So we're going to begin with uh, former Chairman Mike Faith. Pidama. Thank you. How am I talking up here? My friends, relatives, I come to you today with Chante Washte, a good heart. Hemiya, Tutanka Ikichita, Buffalo Soldier, Standing Rock Nation, Mike Faith. If you look at the bio, you see a lot of, um, I got 17 years of actual management with. Um, Buffalo Herd, uh, 21 years of um, politics. I don't know if that's a good mixture or not, but I, um, when I was looking at these uh, questions, I knew that we had to go out of bounds a little bit as far as um, bison, buffalo. I'm going to be using the word buffalo uh, today, but um, you know, what is a healthy community? You know, we got to keep in mind tribes de uh, depended dependency of um, Unchi Maka, Grandmother Earth. Without her, uh, we wouldn't exist. The water, the air, the four-legged, two-legged. So, again, keeping in mind that native um, portion. Again, getting back to uh, what makes a healthy native community. Like I said, I'm going to go beyond um, talking about Buffalo here because unity, understanding your history, understanding the loss of identity, understanding your sovereign rights, your sovereignty, and food sovereignty going into the future. Um, educating everyone of the importance of problem solving now and into the future for a healthier community. With that, some of the areas of concern that we run into, getting to that healthy community, areas of concern, mental health, old and new, you, uh, old and the younger ones, um, various, various types of addictions. The bottom line to a healthy Native community is good governance and a solid strategic plan that addresses the whole person, the people of that tribe. Standing Rock, when I was chairman, we um, got a 25-year strategic plan together. Nothing in stone. It could, it could be changed 
Either way, um, but it meant, it meant to be a betterment, um, a loss of identity, finding out who you are, keeping your language, your culture, and getting businesses, economic, health, getting all that together, better education. So again, using the, the topic or the question of a healthy native community, I would say that uh, a good governance and a solid strategic plan and, and working towards that, it's not gonna happen overnight, but I, I see it happening. And with that comes that healthy, that self-esteem coming up. And I don't know if the, the panel wants to go with the one question or, and then go to the next one. So I think what we'll do is we'll tackle number one and then go on. So that's, again, that, it, it really has, you know, the magnificent animal um, of the buffalo was our part of our day-to-day. -day. It was our clothing, shelter, food source, spirituality. And again, it was that looked up to that that spirituality was, they prayed for good rain, good grass, so the buffalo would come back. So again, I'll leave it at, at that. All right, my name is Mike LeBeau. As you said, I work for Sanford Health. I actually had the opportunity and met Chairman Faith multiple times. I worked in Fort Yates for just short of a dozen years, so spent a lot of time thinking about Native American health, and I'm honored to be here today. Um, when I think of a healthy Native American community, you know, as you pick up your history books and you read about, you know, the history of the buffalo, I think it fits perfectly with what I think about as a healthy Native American community. You know, from a traditional sense, it's a family-focused environment based around activity, hard work, but really with a sense of purpose. Some of my favorite stories would be about, you know, the camps that moved with Buffalo. And if you look at the accounts of tearing a camp down or putting a camp up, there's nothing that you would find in history books that are more organized, full of purpose, and everybody knows their role. As a community, I think that's so important. So whether it's your community at your house or your job, or whether it's the community you live in, I think for all of us to really understand our purpose and our roles, and when we all go through that process together, we win together. And I think it's, it's some of the more motivational things that you would think about. I think there has to be a discussion about the physical health. It's where I spend most of my time and still probably where I spend most of my time today. I think that by the time you, you see the physician, I think we're way too far downstream to think about health of a community. So I'm a kidney doctor by trade and I did internal medicine and so as people began, began to get sicker and sicker, that's where I got involved. And it was where I was most interested when I started my career. In fact, I was just telling the story that as healthy folks came to my clinic, I always enjoyed visiting with folks, but they'd walk out and I'd always feel like it was a waste of time. And it's pretty humbling to say that, but as you think about a community, that's exactly where we should be doing our intervention. And as we talk about what makes a healthy community, I think I can expand on that later. Next has to be mental health. And in the world we live in today, it probably should be number one. And in that mental health, I think, you know, we're going to hear about food insecurity is a huge issue that many people suffer with. And really growing up with the lack of trust of just expectations that we need for survival, I think, carries a big, big risk going forward. 
once again, if you go back in time and think about what it meant for a community to work together, to survive together, I think that purpose is, I think, really probably some of the more meaningful things that you'll read. I think we really have to address you know, how we can get to folks early, how we can get downstream. We spend a lot of time thinking about mental health hospitals. I'd like to think about third grade safety and education and how we affect our children and really get them to grow up feeling good about themselves. That sense of well-being, that sense of community and community well-being, I think, is something that we take for granted. Next is spiritual. When I think of, you know, the buffalo, I think of spirit. I was just saying, you know, the person I work with in our Native American outreach program is at Sundance today. He's new to it. He didn't grow up doing it, but it's something that as he grows into the man he wants to be, it's something that he looks into, and it's something that I think really drives his purpose in life. And a lot of that is based around, you know, Buffalo. And like I said, based around community. I think really having a good understanding of who we are and having pride in that is something that from a community standpoint is important. And that pride and meaning, I think, cannot be understated. That self-reliance and that ability to succeed on our own and succeed together is something that a community needs and something that needs to be worked on. Hi, thank you so much. Uh, such an honor to be with both of you today. Thanks for sharing this space. Thank you for the opportunity um, to Bismarck State College to be here as well. Um, as introduced, my name is Taylor Sievertson, and I have the pleasure of serving as the Director of Ending Hunger 2.0 at the Great Plains Food Bank. And when we think about um, the communities that we serve, we know that we need to meet basic needs. That means getting food to people right now, today, when they need a meal. But thinking about uh, the, the future of communities really means digging a little bit deeper and uncovering um, the, the root causes of hunger and addressing those things so that there aren't folks who need to be coming to a food pantry or soup kitchen. And in preparing for this panel, I'll go a little uh, off course as well. Uh, thanks for the grace to do that, Chairman Faith. I, um, I have made some notes, so I'm gonna refer to some of my notes here. Um, but in, in preparing for this panel, um, I came to this space with a lot of humility and asked for a lot of grace because I am not a Bison expert. Um, but I am someone who is steeped in the knowledge of food and food systems and how food is really at the center of um, how we grow from the land and are connected to the land. And in thinking about some of today's conversation topics, um, you know, what makes a healthy Native community? How is bison a part of that? And what are some of the solutions that really keep bison at the center of a healthy community? I, um, I started to think about, you know, what, what's the sort of opposite side of that? What are some of the barriers to a healthy Native community? You've heard about some of those already. Um, you know, strong political systems that support people, and governments that keep people um, able to thrive and mental health and spiritual health and a connectedness to one another. And one of the things that I bring to this space that I think about through that lens is, um, is food insecurity, as Dr. Lebo mentioned. And when our basic needs aren't being met, it's very difficult to do absolutely anything else. When I think about food, food that nourishes us, that keeps us healthy, that allows us to celebrate our culture and our rich history, and, and really food that um, connects us to our history. Sometimes when you don't have access to food, it's really hard to um, stay connected to one another, stay connected to that rich history. And across the region, Native communities are facing some of the most significant barriers to food insecurity and food access. 
And so when we look at um, supporting a healthy community, we know that we need to address food security, food access, and then nutrition-related chronic disease. So we get, to, we get to share that space a little bit. Thank you for, <laughs> for that. Um, I'll, leave, I'll leave the rest of my responses for, uh, for the other questions. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> and again, um, getting back to the, the second question, how does bison fit into the, the vision? Again, uh, you've got to excuse me. I took some notes down also. So um, getting back to that question, you know, today the Tatanka is symbolic representation of who we once were as a people. As the tribes bring their herds back, it symbolizes the growth and health of its nation. So again, bringing back the buffalo in a good way, storytelling, you know, we always look back, if you, and I'm glad that uh, Dakota's here because, you know, you look at, you don't see no books back in the history. It was always storytelling. This is how they did it. This is how they uh, completed this and that. So in the culture of the native culture, storytelling was day to day. That's how they passed things down. And again, the medicine wheel plays a, a, a big healthy part even to this day of um, not only the four directions, but you know, mentioning the, the healthiness, the mental health, the strength, the emotions, all within that um, medicine wheel. You look at the discussion of uh, European, the European, um, they always talk about well, you need to think outside the box. You know, I, I look at the tribal members and tell them, we need to look within the circle that we live in, the medicine wheel. You know, it, that's where we stay healthy, and that's where we learn within the structure of the medicine wheel. And again, the European model of thinking outside the box, similar. But again, I, I, I like looking at the definition of looking within the, the circle of the medicine wheel. It helps, it helps us identify who we are. I talked about the loss of identity earlier. It's here. You know, we're the song, dance, ceremonies, custom traditions are coming back with the young ones but it has to be passed down from the old um, with the prayers and all that. So, you know, looking at the, the medicine wheel plays, a, to me, a big part of our uh, identity of who we are. And of course, it was a major food source for us. You know, again, I mentioned earlier, food, shelter, clothing, spirituality. Um, it's so important that we educate all Indian, non-Indian, of the importance of the, the magnificent animal, the buffalo. Um, you know, for 17 years, I, I worked out there as a manager. And I'll tell you this, they, you learn daily things that you thought, you know, they, they're survivors. I think it was Kevin Leard I mentioned earlier that, you know, they're or the guy from the park said that they're so healthy that you don't know they're sick until they actually show you. They'll probably lay down or collapse. So again, it's, it's just, to me, it's the importance of keeping that animal alive um, with educating, educating all. Um, so I guess I, I would say that right now as far as the storytelling, you know, um, how does that fit into our uh, vision? Again, telling people how they did this back in the old days, how that animal took care of them. 
So I w I'd probably leave it there and let the uh, next uh, panelist jump on that. <laughs> One of the things that I think about in, um, in ending hunger, we think about um, ending hunger for us at the Great Plains Food Bank means the right food at the right time in the right ways. Getting food to people and ending hunger and building health in a community is not simply about calories or um, the, the easy food or um, things that are cheap because those are things that contribute to um, long-term health consequences. And so when we think about serving Native neighbors with the right food at the right time in the right ways, the buffalo is a really central part of that. And certainly it is not only sustenance, but is really this central part of, um, of culture and ceremony and celebration. And so at the Great Plains Food Bank, we make sure that Bison is part of what we offer to our food pantries and food shelves that distribute food to folks when they need it most. So that even though they are facing a time of need and may not have the ability to purchase the foods that they would uh, on their own, that there's still a great dignity and respect for the culture by providing those sorts of foods. Uh, I have a little more, but I'll, uh, I'd love to hear from you, Dr. Lebeau. I thought for sure she'd, she'd cover that for us. <laughs> um, I think from my perspective, um, a lot has already been said. I think if you think from a community standpoint and if you just think about long-term trauma, I mean, you just have to look back 150 years. You know, 150 years ago, you know, the buffalo ran wild across the plains and it goes back to that conversation that it really made up the way of life. And if you think about the stress of a community and the trauma of a community that a recession or a depression puts on it, just imagine what it was like in the late 1880s when there were only a thousand buffalo left. An entire way of life was wiped out. And as you think about how you recover from that as a community, I think that's, that's a deep-seated question, and it's one that I think is still maybe being answered today and maybe being grappled with today. And how do you as a community put behind, put behind you a trauma that affected multiple generations significantly? And as you just think about the evolution of your kind, it's something that I think that you struggle with today. And as we look at that seven o'clock video tonight and you look at what Standing Rock has done with you know, their Buffalo project, I think it, it should be a sense of pride and it should be a sense of rebirth. And as we think about future and moving forward, I think it's important. The only other thing that I'd comment on is, is really, I appreciated the comments and I was sure we would get is the value of good nutrition. And so when we think about, you know, the spirit of the buffalo and, you know, what it means to have a lean meat, high in protein, associated with a lifestyle that's active, that's community-based, it brings families together, I think that's important. And when we think about how we move forward, um, I would say more the spirit of the buffalo is really what I think about from a nutrition standpoint. How do we find programs that truly value high substance calories, not just food? And I think that's something we got the opportunity to work um, with the food bank a couple of years ago at Sanford and it was really a moving experience and it's stuff you don't really think about as a community. It really is the quality that we bring, not the quantity. And it's something when we look forward, I think it's something we have to talk about. All right, I guess we're getting to our last question here. Um, what has been done to get there? 
Again, um, all three of us are going to have different opinions. Mine's more of a political um, approach. Um, of course, Michael's is uh, medical, and the other one is a uh, food source. So, um, my, my um, answer would be this, and it's going to be a political one, of course, but I believe that in education that represents what we desire as a nation is our future. Leadership must focus on <clears throat> the entire tribe and all its interests. Our future as a people and nation is totally dependent on the efforts and goals of our tribe. Working on a problem and be part of the solution, going back in the past to fix the future, maybe that's what it takes here. Looking at what happened. How did, how did they survive? How did they get along? How did they discipline? How did they do day to day? I think with the technologies these days, we go back in time, utilize what's there with the technologies going into the future. You know, I stated earlier, it's not a pretty picture out there with the addictions, the housing needs, the health needs. It's, it's um, you know, we'll be fooling ourselves today if we didn't mention none of that. Um, Native people have been put through trauma. I mean, so again, please, I'm not trying to um, disrupt, but it's so important for us to go back in time. And these little ones, like the Takoja of mine, my grandson, let's give them a, a better future using the Native culture in a good way. So again, like I said, going back in time may be what we need to fix the, the future with. And as far as the Tatunka Oyate, the Buffalo Nation, they're coming back strong. They were, you heard panelists earlier say that they were almost wiped out. The Buffalo were almost gone. So as we as a Native people. The buffalo are coming back strong, and so are we as a native people. So they go hand in hand. We depend on each other that much. How? Oh. All right. I'd probably think of this in two parts. You know, as I look to the future, I would first look at Native American community. I think it's by far and away the most important thing. And it goes back to kind of my original thoughts. We think about community health. I think we need to focus on general well-being, sense of purpose and pride. As you think about all of the folks that are living in poverty today, living with illiteracy or with addiction, I think we have to find a purpose that's it's meaningful and it can drive an entire community. I always like to start with children as well. I think, you know, if we believe that children truly are the future, and if we get to where we're at in life, maybe we're imprinted and we're set, and you might have a hard time convincing me to change much. But what about our kids? So as we think about our school systems and what we offer, I think it's important for us to think differently about where we're at. One of the more controversial things I like to say is I like to think about Indian culture and tradition, but I think like any tradition, any religion, I think it's important that we look at it and really make it meaningful in today's society. I think to get caught in the past, I think to look at the past is important and learn where we're at, but to take the best of our past 
and add it to our future and really be able to change the tribal tradition and the culture to fit with who we want to be tomorrow, I think is important. And it's a difficult exercise. I think it's difficult for anybody going through that. When I think of that, I think about tradition of feast. You know, feast in the 1870s was a fantastic experience. It was done after a significant hunt, after a significant event, before a significant activity. But in today's world, when we talk about quality, we probably don't feast like we're supposed to. And I think that's a lot of cultures. I don't think it's just Native American culture. But when we think about what is tradition, I think we should be part of the group setting what our tradition is for the next hundred years. So take what was beautiful from the last hundred and add it and make it a healthy lifestyle. Regular activity and exercise. Time in self-meditation and prayer. Quality time with family. If that's our tradition, and, and as you read through books, when I think of the buffalo hunt, that's what was special to me is, that's exactly what a buffalo hunt was, was it was quality time for a community to spend together. I think it's important that we think about our well-being and we can pick off each of our addiction, medical health, mental health, and to me it should really be a community's involvement in what a healthy lifestyle is gonna look like. And then let's make that our tradition. And a hundred years from now, we'll look back at our elders and we won't re be able to remember 200 years ago, but instead, a hundred years ago, our elders said, this is what a healthy tradition is. But that's something a community has to buy into. From a medical perspective, I could spend all day, it's probably something I think about lots, is how do you improve wellness in a community? I really believe we need a different model. The delivery of health care on Indian reservations is broken. We count on our government, and anybody who picks up the paper has read many, many times about the state of veterans affairs, VA health care. And I mean, there's scandals, there's terrible reports, and I'll let you know that the VA is funded at just about 50% more than Indian Health Service per member. So the waiting lists that kill people at the VA, the lack of care and resources at the VA is twice as good as Indian Health Service. And very rarely do I pick up an article in any national paper and read about the barren landscape of Indian Health Service. So we have to think about how we deliver care differently. I think whether it's virtual medicine, whether it's protocol-driven medicine, whether we can find more nurses to deliver care differently, I think is important. I think to set an expectation, one of the most heartbreaking things in my career was when I sat down in a um, clinical exam room in Fort Yates, the patient would sit down and their expectation of me was never what it should be. If I forgot to follow up on a lab test or didn't get medication to a pharmacy, that was okay. And until we change the expectation and really the delivery of care, I don't know that we'll ever get where we need to be. And if you take that model, you can deal with mental health, you can deal with addiction studies, or addiction, you can deal with all of it in the same thing. And so it's really, I think, a, a thorn in my side, and it's really something that, you know, I like to spend my time contemplating. But I think the, the care and the delivery of health care needs to change as we go forward.
Both of you mentioned politics briefly, so I'll, I'll too mention politics briefly and we can move on from it. Uh, but it is a critical part, critical responsibility um, if we take a moment and look back at history and um, recognize the disinvestment of land, the separation and genocide of people, and um, genocide of culture. The the United States federal government has a responsibility to support Native people. And through public benefits like social safety net programs like SNAP, which is uh, the food stamps program, WIC, uh, program that supports women, infants, and children, commodities for seniors and those distributed on federal, um, excuse me, uh, on tribal lands. Those programs need an overhaul. Um, they are the ways that we keep people um, secure until they have the opportunity to thrive. That, those are the things that serve as the launching pad to keep a family from falling through the cracks. And so when we think about food security and economic security, those are some of the cornerstones. Reducing barriers to understanding those programs, using those programs, um, even knowing how to fill out an application, it is a critical part of supporting the health of Native communities. I also want to add one thing that hasn't come up yet is um, I think as North Dakotans, we've maybe heard um, the, the phrase food desert. A food desert is this idea of a community or area where there's not enough access to fresh fruits, vegetables, or other healthful whole foods, and there maybe aren't grocery stores or farmers markets or other um, healthful food distributors. And when we look at a map of where are there food deserts in the state of North Dakota, a little orange block shows up on almost every federally recognized um, reservation. And so we know that those communities are facing even greater barriers to food access. And food desert is actually not a great term because it's an outcome instead of a, a, a really telling the true story. If we were to plop a grocery store in a community that's a food desert right now, it wouldn't work. That's not how you solve the problem of food access. In order to support a grocery store, you need to have an economic base that can pay for that grocery store. That'd be a very high uh, financial risk. And so instead of plopping in a grocery store that would eventually fail and saying, but look, see, it's not actually a problem about food access. People don't want to buy that healthful food. I think often of this phrase um, that I heard a long while ago, wrote on a sticky note, and is in my office behind me every day. And it says that the choices we make are based on the choices we have. So instead, I think about these communities as suffering or experiencing or influenced by food apartheid. Food apartheid is this idea that um, there is political system that is imbued with racial discrimination or systemic discrimination that has led to a food desert, that disinvestment of land, that genocide of people and culture. I've spent a little more time talking about politics than I had intended to. Thank you for letting me <laughs> be on a soapbox about um, a food access because that is a significant barrier for folks uh, all across the nation, but particularly in Native nations. And so in order to solve for and provide for healthy communities, we need to think a little bit differently about how we solve those problems, not just plopping a grocery store in a community like that. Thinking about food sovereignty. How do we grow, garden, ranch, and uh, teaching people how to cook, preserve, store, share. And those are some of the solutions that uh, we think about when we think about supporting a community that's facing some of those um, challenges to whole health. 
Well, thank all of you. You've given us a lot to think about, and I've, I've got a lot of questions kind of bouncing around in my head here as a result of your comments, and I, I really appreciate your comments about the food desert. Um, so my question is, I, mean, I heard what you said at the end, it's that we have to teach people how to do this, and to, but, but what do we do? If, I, if somebody came to you and said, okay, let's solve it today, what are the two things that we have to do to solve this food desert problem? Well, I think the first thing is uh, shifting power back to Native communities. Uh, I don't think we solve for um, Native communities and, and community leaders. I think it's really asking um, folks in those communities how they interact with food. Uh, maybe a Cisco truck driving from across the state that's no longer stopping in that community because of um, supply chain shortages and staffing shortages isn't the, um, the solution, but I, I'm not sure I have two solutions to give you, but I do think it starts with um, shifting power back to Native communities. Chairman? Again, <clears throat> going back, um, getting all the information we can t from the elders, mm -hmm. you know, how food sovereignty into the future with climate change coming right, up, right upon us. I think um, it's more important now than ever to start these uh, educating our own people of um, how, they, how did they plant different types of um, small gardens. Um, what did they do with the deer, the elk, the buffalo? How did they preserve it? Um, how did they can it? Um, little things that maybe just uh, nothing new to an elder, but for our young ones to look at, into the future for survival, um, we have to go back in the past um, to keep our future alive. And again, uh, I say that in a, in a good way because um, Standing Rock is a little behind on the food sovereignty. We have some uh, people down there that are pushing it hard. But if you go to other reservations, they're, they're above and beyond where we're at. As far as greenhouses, um, wind turbines, solar, keeping those year-round food supplies um, with little help, maybe with electricity and propane, but they're trying to get away from all that and go back to a time of self-sufficiency where you, you did it yourself. You canned your own food, you butchered your own deer, um, butchered your own buffalo, you put it away. I mean, you, you look at you know, it may be a, a form of really going back, but you know, when they when they dug areas in the dirt, it wasn't just for digging a hole. It served a purpose of um, preserving um, root cellars, whatever whatever they could do back in the day. So, to me, food sovereignty is really, really a, a must for these young ones to learn. And I, I definitely appreciate everybody that's helping out in that area because, like I said, the climate change, you know, I, 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 we can't fool ourselves. It's, it's coming here. When I say Unchi Maka, Grandmother Earth, getting tired, you know, um, so we have to start helping and going back to a more simpler time and preserving our foods, canning our foods, just um, so we can survive in the future. So food sovereignty, um, the buffalo just plays a big, big part of that also. You know, we mentioned uh, food, shelter, clothing, spirituality. Um, you know, the deer, the, the elk, they all serve the, that purpose. Um, planting our own gardens. It, 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 um, a lot of the old timers could give you good hints of how to do this, how to do that. Especially if you look at the different uh, regions down southwest compared to the northern plains. 
What grows the best? What time of the year do you plant? Little things like that will definitely help the future out. Um, it, it's passed down from the elders to people that can pass it on to the younger ones that can you never know, it may be that life or death at that time to, uh, into the future of survival. So planning a little, I, I know, I'll, I'll tell you a little story about uh, the walkers. My, my mother was a walker, full blood. Um, she, uh, they used to live along the Missouri, north of um, Fort Yates, south of Cannibal. Um, <clears throat> and I always remember before the water come up is that um, Grandpa Paul, he had two black horses. I was in the spring. You'd have Williamson's, Good Lefts, Keepsy Golds, and the Walkers. They'd all come together. And of course, back then, they always had a food. They had coffee on. They had soup going. They had, a, of all things, in the summertime, even a stove going outside, of course, in, in the shade and stuff. But they would all come together and, and put a, a community, kind of a friendly garden together. They would all um, help put in whatever, and as they matured, they would come and take their portions and leave, but a lot of visiting, laughing, uh, storytelling. And I always remember that, I was fairly young, but um, that round bread, that uh, gabubu bread they call it, but it was a fry pan. I mean, that, they always had that on, that and coffee, uh, but they would always do that garden. And being on the bottom down there along the Missouri, I mean, that was, that, when you turn that dirt, that was dark, that was good soil. And of course they came along, they hoed it, they, I always thought that was like a 20 acre garden. It might have been only four or five acres back then, but to me, I mean, they, they did everything with the, the plow of the horse, they picked it, they took the weeds out, um, the corn in you know, late fall. You know, I always remember uh, Grandma Gray Bear, she would, uh, it was a white cloth. It most likely was a, a sheet of some type, but they had it there above, and they had um, corn, they were drying corn but it had air, and then they would turn it. And of course, um, her two daughters would always, they would always carry little um, tree branches. But it was for a reason, I guess, you know, flies and whatever, they're always swishing around. So again, getting prepared for the winter. Uh, they had a big, big pile of wood cut, split, ready to, you know, there was chores all the time. So again, going back in time, um, seeing them get prepared for the winter months and doing it as a group. You know, I think the Williams had probably lived two miles to the north. Um, Keeps the gold were probably a mile to the south. So, but they would always come in um, and help. Again, that was part of uh, surviving through um, heavy winters and getting ready for fall and doing it in the fall, the hunts. Um, it was from rabbits to deer. Back then it was, you know, the buffalo were pretty much not coming back. 1965 was when Standing Rock got their first animals back from um, Teddy Roosevelt. They set aside some land, but, you know, they always came together and, and helped each other out, get those prepared for winter months. I'm just going to guess, Chairman, you talked about the river bottoms. That's probably all flooded now. Yeah, it's, it's, been, it's been flooded for quite some time. So you can almost tell how old I am, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when Michael was talking, he was talking elder pointing. <laughs> yeah, so. I, wasn't saying, I wasn't saying anything. <laughs> but again, <clears throat> yeah, it was. It was before the... Before the uh, Flood Control Act took um, all the, the prime land, the, the nice um, wildlife down there, 
it, it was a, probably a more relaxed time, but there was a lot of hard work that went into getting prepared for the winter months too. But they didn't, they didn't really show it. There was a lot of laughing and talking um, that we saw. So, but they passed that down. Saw how that was done. Even to the wood chopping, to get, you had to go get it. I mean, even in a dead of winter, you still had to take the ashes out of the stove, get it outside, pump water from a well. I mean, so I, I kind of remember those days, but the thing that keeps in mind is the community garden that they did. It's a family plot from the walkers, but you had three different groups come and help maintain it, and they all gave, everybody got equal out of that, so. Dr. LeBeau, see, um, when Taylor responded, which I thought was beautifully, that she's not about to tell Native people how to solve this problem. Right. I, I thought that's a remarkable answer. I'm not gonna let him off the hook, because he's an enrolled member of a tribe, and he's a doctor, so now I'm going to ask him, how do we fix Indian Health Service that you talked about? Yeah, yeah I, was actually going to, I was actually going to point to Mike and say, that's a great question. I would have probably scheduled a meeting with Mike and said, hey, we got a problem. You need to fix it. Um, probably how I would have went about it. But um, in my mind, I, I think of, and I've, floated this theory multiple times. It's, I believe in my heart that, well, I'll say it, on my bad days, I feel like the government, it's set up as more of a harmful agent. That's on my bad days, um, the way Indian Health Service sits today. There's enough health care that you have to go, but not enough health care to be healthy. Um, if I had my druthers, I would take that federal money and I would run it through all tribes. And I've probably even pitched this to Mike in the past. I've pitched it to everybody else. And there's a structure called 638. You take the federal money and you run it through the tribe and the tribe then has control over the health care dollar. But then what I would do is I would then bid that out. I think one of the most harmful things of Indian Health Service is if you look at the quality of recruitment. Recruitment is very, very difficult for everybody. Whether you live in Bismarck or Fargo, trying to recruit a physician is hard. It's very hard whether you're from Hedinger, whether you're from Williston. I mean, small communities, it's hard to hire health care. And then you throw into a system where you are handcuffed by lack of resource, I think it really turns people away from the system. And what you get to recruit from now is not the cream of the crop. And so, and not all the time, right? I think if we can grow our own, if you can send local folks to school, support them and bring them back, that might be some of the best care you'll ever get. But if, when that doesn't work, and you have to go out onto the open market and find providers, many times they're providers that have been to 15 or 20 locations that have had trouble in the past, and maybe this is the last stop. And so when you start leading with that, I, I don't think you get the care you need. I would like to see the tribes have control over the federal money, but then my preference would be is that they would use somebody to deliver care, and so they're now paying for a consulting company to deliver care with the caveat that they have the same expectation of outcomes as you would in Bismarck or Washburn or Minot, that the same standards are delivered. One of my proudest stories to tell was for 10 years in a row, the number one rated dialysis unit in all of Sanford was 48. It was a... Uh, and who was the doctor there? No, this was before me. I'd like to take credit. I, I, I can't take the credit. Actually, it's Abel Tello, I think, is when it started. Um, 
maybe I got to ride it for a while, but I think it's a joint venture. It's one that we work together. It's something that we would manage, but we would have expectations, and the care that was delivered was as good as anywhere in Sanford. And to me, that model of a true approach of teamwork with modern day care, and in that model, you can now start to truly think about how we manage diabetes differently, how we do screenings differently, how we introduce virtual care. You know, it's when you start talking about food deserts, in those food deserts, to convince somebody from the south side of Standing Rock to travel to Fort Yates is difficult. They don't go to Fort Yates. And so now I'm trying to convince them to, if they won't meet me in Bismarck, will they meet me in Fort Yates? The answer is still no. Well, we can now start to think about how we can deliver community care differently and maybe virtually and, and let people stay home and just populate. So I really believe that it has to be tribally managed. Um, and I think most tribes, if they were to be most successful, they would then take that and then use that money. And then we could talk about at-risk dollars and spend what we have. It sounds like a sovereignty issue to me. I mean, that would, for sure. Okay, I've got two more questions, and then we're gonna, I'm gonna walk up here with the mic and see if we've got any questions up here. Ms. Sievertson, I said it right? Yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so uh, you had uh, mentioned that at the food bank, you wanna have uh, culturally respective respected foods and stuff. Do you get bison at, at the food bank or have you ever gotten it? I... You know, that's a tricky thing. Um, so any food that we receive because we um, have uh, federal standards around food safety that we have to manage has to be processed in a commercial kitchen and processed under certain standards. So we, uh, from my knowledge, I'm looking at our food resource manager who's in the, in the <laughs> audience today, from my knowledge, I don't believe we've received recent donations of, um, of buffalo. We do purchase food. Uh, a great deal of the food that comes through the charitable food system is purchased through donations and fundraising and grant dollars um, of generous donors all across the area. So um, we purchase that. Thank you. And Chairman, my last question. Um, is there a program at Standing Rock? Well, let me back up a little bit. I, I've, I've read a lot about the use of bison it's, to the issues Dr. LeBeau was talking about for spiritual health, for mental health, and so forth. And that, the, that some of the reservations have very specific programs to address those issues using the bison as, I, I guess, a mechanism to improve mental health and spiritual health and stuff like that. Are there specific programs or is it just the presence of the bison and, and the ceremonies that go involved? Is there a specific program? Am I making sense on that? Well, first of all, you have the food distribution, a USDA program that do get one pound uh, burger that they'll give it out to the um, participants or the, the ones that are eligible. Um, back in the day, I used to knock a bowl down and get a process, give it to food, food distribution, to the elderly programs, and we also had um, three freezers, three freezers at the Game of Fish, where if somebody needed or wanted uh, buffalo meat for the purpose of a, a ceremony, a naming, or just for need, um, based off of um, diabetes program saying you should probably try to get this more leaner uh, meat, and the tribe has it. Um, we we try to get that, but at, with the um, COVID, everything just you know I got three animals processed right away. We try to help as we went on didn't realize how long it was going to be. The processing plants almost come to a stop during that time. So um, we have outs, uh, resources available for, um, like I said, sun dances, ceremonies, um, people of, that want to just ask for it 
for the purpose of um, a healthier choice. Uh, again, <laughs> you're going to find out that the younger ones, or even to the middle-aged ones, uh, has that little bit of wild smell and taste to it. So when you're frying it or whatever, it um, doesn't appeal to a lot of people, surprisingly. But it is a, a healthier. We try to educate a lot of um, schools. Um, <clears throat> in fact, we are trying to get buffalo meat into the schools as we speak. And it's been ongoing for years and years, not only through my administration, the previous one now, uh, others pr before me, um, to get it into the schools, either to be a public school or grad school or 638 school. Um, try to get it in there and be part of that healthiness. Obesity in America is, is pretty tough, so try to do our part there. Um, right now, um, marketing, you know, when, when I was on <clears throat> as the Buffalo manager, I did get a uh, marketing plan available. Um, but again, it's up to the tribe as far as how far they want to go with that. But right now, the animals are there available for um, elders, for ceremonies. Um, and I don't know to, today if they reopened up um, those freezers as far as the general public or membership asking for them. But um, the plan is, is to market some and then, of course, you know, try to get it into the schools for um, lot, right now you got so many um, uh, warmers, you warm up this, you warm up that, pizzas, um, what am I about thinking of McDonald's, um, McNuggets and things like that. Um, we're trying to get away and, and see if we can get the, the Buffalo Beat into um, our school program. It, in fact, some years back, the Standing Rock Grant School, which at that time had 700 students in it, we would have at least three times a week some type of buffalo in their, in their menu. And again, you're not governed by the century code of a state. Um, you're contracted it, so you, um, as long as it's approved of back then by USDA or a state facility that had a USDA inspector, uh, then they did a little, not quite a co-op with the public school, and that all went out the window because of um, they didn't allow that. So there is there is avenues of getting it. And, you know, it's up to um, our members to, to ask for it. All right, do we have any questions? Oh, right away. Uh, Mr. Sievertson, uh, just wondering, uh, does the food bank go to uh, the reservations specifically uh, on a regular scheduled basis? And what kind of protein uh, is provided? Because that's what the people need is a lot of protein, particularly kids, because their mind is still developing. And uh, if they don't get the protein, their mind isn't going to develop. But uh, also, the, the reservation, uh, both Standing Rock and Sisseton, kind of straddle the, the state line. So. Is, is the food bank available to the people in South Dakota also? Great question. So I will um, take a step back and just give a little bit of a primer about how our food bank operates. So we, um, we serve the entire state of North Dakota in one county in Minnesota. And we are the only food bank in the state. Um, I think sometimes folks interchange food bank and food pantry, and so I want to pull those apart a little bit. We serve as um, sort of this, this hub, um, this clearinghouse that can access food on um, a large scale from all across the nation. And then we have an operations and logistics system that crisscrosses the state and works directly with over 200 food pantries, food shelves, soup kitchens, shelters, and other types of food distribution sites. 
We have a number of um, food pantry partners who work directly um, on the Standing Rock Nation specifically uh, on the North Dakota side of the border. We right now um, are in a, sort of a feasibility study, a pilot project uh, exploratory phase where we uh, at the Great Plains Food Bank are part of this national network of food banks through Feeding America. So we have very close partnerships with the food banks in other states, but there have been a lot of um, barriers to crossing borders when we know that there is a, a geographic area that crosses a state border. Um, so right now we are in the process of working with Feeding South Dakota, the South Dakota Food Bank, to better understand how we might collectively serve the entire um, Standing Rock Nation and Sistin Wapten Oyate in particular. The um, question about, um, so more to come, we'll, we'll see as that, um, as that develops. Um, but the question about uh, protein, so we, we operate through these partner agencies, we call them soup kitchens, shelters, food pantries, and uh, they distribute directly to their neighbors. Through our warehouse, this big clearinghouse system, we try to have a variety of nutritious product that those food pantry partners or partners of ours can select from. And so that includes right now, if I am remembering what our current inventory looks like, it changes pretty frequently, but we have um, we have chicken, we have turkey, we, I don't think we have ground beef right now because that's been tricky to get our hands on. We do have um, some buffalo meat. We often have canned protein, uh, canned meats that are packed in water, low sodium. And then we also have a wide variety of non-meat proteins like um, lentils and beans, dried beans, um, nut butters, peanut butter. So whenever we are supporting a community, we try to have a wide variety of um, nutritious food uh, across the spectrum that's meeting that community's needs. One last thing I'll add to that is we also operate a program called a mobile food pantry, which um, Dr. Lebeau's team helped out with a couple of years ago, where we know some communities simply do not have the ability to host a food pantry. So we will load up our semi-truck full of food, drive that to a community that is underserved or under-resourced, and then distribute directly to folks. Um, we actually load food right into their vehicle. And so that's one other way that we're able to get food um, directly to our native nations. Yeah. Thank you for that question. Uh, my question is to Chairman Faith. On a follow-up question uh, from Larry's question, about how to fix the IHS budget. And the response over here was about a 638ing. If you 638 something, do you not take the trust responsibility away from the government and put it right back on the tribe? And what happens if they run out of a budget? Could you uh, elaborate a little bit more on the 638? I'll just touch a little bit on that because, you know, it's, it's, um, federal law that you can contract any federal program out there from IHS to um, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, uh, either through uh, 638 or grant, the grant process, like, for example, the Standing Rock Community Grant School uh, could have went 638, but the advantage over uh, 638 and grant, their grant, you can utilize some of your forward funded money to put in a bank to let it work for you, whereas under 638, um, that's kind of a zero-based budget. They want you to commit to all of that. Although they allow um, some carryovers, um, but again, uh, it's up to the tribe if they want to, it, it's a law out there that allows the tribe to contract. Uh, law enforcement, oh, yeah. land operations, realty, uh, schools, IHS. Right now, Standing Rock hasn't um, done anything over at Indian Health Service. Um, again, it, if you did, it still doesn't take the trust responsibility away. If you contracted, 
I mean, you're, you're doing the services, but the trust responsibility still lies within that um, organization, whether it be Bureau of Indian Affairs, Indian Health Service, um, BIE, Bureau of Education. So again, it, it's, it's up to the tribe. Um, and you really, I would say this though, you really have to watch what you're gonna be taking up. If you wanna contract something, make sure the funding's coming with it because a lot of times they're gladly give it to you and the funding is on a down, down cycle. So you're expecting you to supplement that somehow. So again, you're probably stealing from Peter to pay Paul or if your casino is doing well, picking up other areas of need, all of a sudden it's supplementing uh, a government program that should be self-sufficient itself. They're cutting back on funding where you may have a need for 10 employees and they're going to give you enough for five. So it almost, it almost sets you up for failure if you do not have a supplement through taxes or um, casino revenue that can offset that. So <clears throat> it's really important to the tribes, for the tribes to look at how's that sitting financially the last 10 years and how does it look into the future? Because tribal roads is on a down, down, uh, down slide financially. So with the taxes that the tribe get and um, some of the casino revenue have to bring that back up. Um, so it's losing its, uh, defeating its purpose of contracting. You're almost um, set up for failure in some areas. So you gotta almost wanna make sure that you have that funding into the future. So you don't have to retrocede it back, make the tribe look bad if they have to give a, a program back. It looks like they failed it, but uh, unfortunately sometimes the federal government, if, in the, I just mentioned them, the BIE, BIA, uh, IHS, don't bring the funding. Law enforcement, you know, we haven't contracted law enforcement yet, and they're still probably short 15 employees. Law enforcement, boots on the ground, officers. So, you know, they're saying, well, you could contract. <clears throat> Why contract something that is going to fail on you? You're not going to have enough police officers. Um, you're going to have burnout. Um, you're going to have to supplement. So you got to be prepared for that. Um, it, yes, it's a federal law where you can contract, but I would say to anybody under a tribal status is watch, watch how that funding cycle has been going. If you give me just two minutes, I would say, from my perspective, I, I really appreciate the comment, right? But I'll tell you, tribes are supplementing health care today, whether they like to or not. And when they don't, it's on the backs of the, of the patients. So in my mind of the 638 is, if there's enough dollars that there's enough dollars that it's $1,100 per member, you bid the contract what we call at risk. And so if it was gonna be me, I would say, if you give me $1,100 per member, I'll take care of them. You know what your budget is at the beginning of the year. If I spend $1,300 per member, that's on me. I'll, I'll eat the difference and it's called at-risk dollars. It now gives me true flexibility in how I spend my dollar. I can now spend it on food. I can now spend it on transportation. I can spend it on a lot of different things, but I'll take $1,100 per member. That's what the federal government gives. Um, and if I spend any more, it's on me. So it's a set budget in the, in the tribal budget. You have a set dollar amount. If I can, deliver quality care for $900 per member, I'll split it with you. So we have $200 per member that we save, I'll split it with you. I'll give 100 back, I'll take 100, and I might even make some money at it. So it's a different model of care. We have to think different than how we deliver care today. How we deliver care today with just every incident, every visit, 
generates a bill is not a sustainable model for Indian Health Service. But in that risk budget, a 638, where I can now truly sit down and say what's important for the people, transportation, food, exercise, we may be, be able to invest together. I might be able to convince um, chairman to invest in a wellness center. And we might invest in three vans to get people back and forth to appointments. We might invest in infrastructure for um, telehealth, virtual care to keep people at home. And so it's a completely different model, but it's one that I think if we're gonna look out 50 years in Indian Health Service, it's gonna have to be something that's much more, you know, inside the, inside the wheel more than it is what we're doing today. Because what we're doing today is not a sustainable model. Okay, we've got one, one more question. Hello? Yep, you're on. Okay, good. I worked for the Cooperative Extension Service and of course our goal is education. We do education in gardening, food prep, uh, food storage, and so on, uh, but the thing that drives me crazy is how do you change the attitudes to get it done? And, and you made such a good point by saying, I'm not gonna tell them how to do it. They have to do it. But I wanna know how we can influence that attitude to get the doing done. That's what I have to say. Well, I think there's, there's an interesting key here that um, what, what makes you interested in trying something new? What makes all of us interested in doing something a little outside our comfort zone? There's, there's maybe some creativity in that, that problem solving. One of, the, um, one of the successes we've seen in some communities in, in northwestern North Dakota is um, bringing elders and kindergartners together and pairing um, this deep, rich history, who are sometimes grandparents or great-grandparents, with small, young children. And the joy that comes from play and um, tasting and touching food um, can be shared between parties like that. So that's one, um, one idea, but I think that um, it comes from thinking about the things we all enjoy when we're learning, uh, being able to do while we are learning. Um, yeah. Thanks for that question. I think it also comes from uh, it, these kinds of conversations mm -hmm. by you folks saying some things that are at issue or offering up places where you're looking for responses and these folks thinking about that too, we can make things better. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, how many of you have canned in your past? Okay, uh, how many of you have taught somebody how to can? Okay, so there are a few of us here, and I think that, that that's the power that we're talking about here, is just, just open the conversation and we'll, we'll all do better. Thank you. Well, this panel draws to a close. Thank you so much to our panelists. What an engaging conversation. Thank you, thank you. I appreciate it.